uh, those of you who are familiar with the uh, traditions of our USG meetings, Ukraine study group meetings, note that this is a more informal affair than our seminars. It is accompanied by uh, food for the body as well as uh, food for the mind and soul. So please feel free to uh, refresh your plates uh, or your glasses uh, and uh, do not uh, hesitate uh, to get up if you feel the need. Uh, however, we will get started and it is my special both privilege and pleasure to introduce a first time visitor, first but I hope not the last time visitor to our institute, uh, the Reverend Dr. Cyril Hovorun, Otec Archimandrit Kirillo uh, Hovorun. Uh, who comes, uh, well, he is a person, I think, uh, of some contradiction. So I will start with one contradiction. He comes to us from both near and far. Near because he's come immediately from Yale University, which is only three hours by train, uh, where he is a research fellow, and far because he actually comes from Kiev and more recently even Moscow, where he has served in the uh, Ukrainian Orthodox Church under the jurisdiction of the Patriarch of Moscow. Uh, he is a person who has devoted a good part of his life to rather esoteric, shall we say for many of us subjects, <laughs> Christological controversies of the first centuries uh, of, our, of the Christian era, uh, patristic the, uh, theological issues, etc. But he also has been both writing and speaking about contemporary issues, uh, church and society and politics, uh, so he brings together, you know, many uh, interesting qualities and attributes, which I think should give us a very fascinating, uh, you know, uh, two hours, uh, both in his presentation and I hope in the discussion that will follow. Just a, a very few uh, words about um, his uh, background. Uh, his uh, studies were conducted both uh, again in Ukraine at the Kiev uh, Theological Academy where he received his first um, a doctorate and uh, completed his first dissertation. His second was uh, in, at the University of Durham in the United Kingdom and the dissertation that he presented there was subsequently published uh, under a slightly revised title of Will, Action and Freedom, Christological Controversies in the Seventh Century, uh, published by Leiden Brill. Uh, he has a total of seven books and uh, articles, chapters of books, edited collections that are so numerous that if I started reading them, that would take up to two hours. Uh, what is especially you know, remarkable when you look at it is simply the number of languages, some of which I can recognize, in which he has published, uh, in addition to Ukrainian and uh, Russian and English. There's Greek, there are all kinds of versions of Slavonic, I imagine that includes Bulgarian, Serbian, Macedonian, I can't distinguish which is which, uh, but uh, you know, a very impressive uh, bibliography. Uh, indeed. In addition to his uh, academic credentials and work, uh, he has uh, filled the position of uh, President of the Department of External Affairs uh, of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate. He was uh, first Deputy Chair of the Educational Committee of the Russian Orthodox Church, Vice Rector of the Postgraduate and Doctoral School of the Russian Orthodox Church, and he participated in a great many both academic and ecumenical uh, meetings um, and participated in uh, dialogues, which uh, again, he, uh, uh, he, br br uh, he gives a special, uh, special uh, status to his remarks today. So without any more ado, mm -hmm. I will uh, ask him to address us and he has chosen as his team today uh, actually, it's a verse from uh, Pablo Tecina, Na Maidani Kolo Cerkvi, Revolucija Ide, which because this will be in English, uh, I've sort of also given another title, The Church and Revolutionary Upheaval in Ukraine. Uh, those of you who have been followed, and I think that's everybody here, uh, events in Ukraine, or even looked at the front page photographs in the New York Times, will remember the importance of um, the churches uh, in these uh, events. And uh, the perspective of a churchman and of this particular church, I think, will be very interesting for us. So, with no more ado, uh, 
Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, for your kindest words of introduction. It is a great privilege for me to be here. I feel like a bit, you know, coming from a small sister, from a smaller sister of Harvard. Mm -hmm. uh, well, in some sense, I feel really Ukrainian here, <laughs> um, and it is really uh, it's my it's not my first time in Harvard, definitely, but it's my first time here at the institute, and it is really a great privilege. And um, I thought it was really a great opportunity to address to address such a distinguished uh, auditorium. Um, indeed, the topic of my of, of my presentation uh, will be on the role of the churches, Ukrainian churches, in the uh, recent recent developments in Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine is now in the focus of of the world media and uh, uh, people in many countries. Uh, and uh, one of the aspects of the events that uh, occurred and still uh, are going on in Ukraine is the religion, the churches, uh, and uh, their role in the appeal. And I'd like to, to explore a bit more uh, this, this aspect. Well, the first two lines of, uh, of the short piece of poetry composed by Pablo Tachina in 1918, which exactly I chose as a, the topic of my of my presentation resonate with uh, today's Ukraine as never before. Even in the years when the verse was written, the Ukrainian word Maidan, a square, has become recognizable in the whole world. The two lines of Tichina's poetry illustrate that the social awakening that happened at the Kievan Maidan has a strong religious dimension. The churches stood next to the Maidan and at the Maidan during the entire period of the protests. I will begin exploring the relationship between the Maidan and the churches with a story which was told by a Ukrainian blogger Olesya Mamchich, a mother of two kids of eight and three years. This story is about her husband Sashko and what he and many other peaceful people like him had to face during the three cold months of the protests against the corrupted regime in Kyiv. This is actually one of many of thousands, thousands of stories told online in blogs, in uh, Facebook posts and so forth about what was going on. And actually it is difficult to choose to select one which would, which would strike because all of them are really remarkable and this is one of them. Uh, a bus full of the Berkut, you know, the, some of you know the Berkut, the special forces which became infamous for their brutality to the protesters, attacked our blue Lanos, driven by Sashko. He was pulled out of the car, put on the ground and beaten. Later on, together with others, he was brought somewhere nearby, I suspect, I suspect the Mariinsky Park. There, though snow was falling, the earth was in the blood. They released two girls on their way while they took the boys out there. Sashko had a wonderful grandfather's army coat, our family heirloom. We did not see the coat anymore, but it doesn't matter. They laid the boys on, uh, in sweaters on the minus 20 Celsius degrees coat on the ground and some put on their knees. They held them thus for up to two hours. Something human awakened in their soul, because on the halfway they threw on Sashko's shoulders someone's, someone else's jacket. While Sashko was on his knees in the snow, the Berkut man conducted a lesson of political information, telling their point of view on the Maidan. In particular, they were extremely interested in how much we were paid. Well, at least 200 hryvnas is for sure, it's approximately $20. They were not convinced by, by, the, by the answers. And the final touch. They required from Sashko to say, Glory be to the Berkut. My husband said, Glory be to everyone who has not lost conscience. Con conscience. This story, I think, reveals the core of the civil strife, which became incarnate in the Maidan. People on the one side of the Kievan barricades firmly believed that, uh, the social, that social activity could be only assimilation stimulated with money, 
fear and power. These values, widely admired in the post-Soviet countries, were demonstrated by the soldiers of the Burkhut and thousands who participated in the so-called anti-Maidans in support of Mr. Yanukovych and his regime. They, they supported a regime which also believed only in money, fear, and power. Actually, there is another version of, of the belief of this regime that they believe, still believed in three things, money, money, and money. Uh, on the other side of the barricades, people stood with resolve to die in hope that there are things that matter more than money, comfort, health, and the very life. They summarized all these values in the words conscience and dignity. In essence, the Maidan was all about dignity. It was rightly branded the Maidan of dignity. In the system of the political and social coordinates which dominated in Ukraine in the last years, such words as dignity, justice, and democracy were just words. In the reality behind these words were, was opposite to their original meaning. Dignity, justice, and democracy in this system coordinates were imitational, not real. I call this a semantic shift, when the words from the political lingua franca effectively function like homonyms when applied to the post-Soviet sociopolitical realities. In effect, these realities can be better described by the antonyms. What is called democracy is, in fact, authoritarianism. What is called justice is a complete corruption of the juridical system. Anti-fascism suspiciously resembles fascism, etc. This system has prevailed in the majority of the former Soviet republics after the collapse of the Soviet Union. The post-Soviet sociopolitical system is in some sense eclectic and postmodernist. On the one hand, it, it features elements of the old communist ideology and of the Soviet political traditions. And on the other hand, it has adopted many elements of the Western political systems. Its modern nature was probably best described, deciphered, by the modern Russian writer Viktor Pilevin, probably if you've read him, and uh, especially in his novels Generation P, English titles uh, Homo Zapiens and Babylon and snuff. However, the eclectism of the post-Soviet political model does not mean that this model is temporary or transitory. It has been ossified and became a self-sufficient structure. It is probably not post-Soviet anymore, but neo-Soviet. It has received a powerful sponsor who endorses it with every means, the President of the Russian Federation. Recently, this system has been endowed with an ideology. Thus, kleptocracy has turned to a civilizational project. The newly born neo-Soviet ideology now expresses itself in the religious terms and resembles a civil religion as Robert Bella described it. Uh, actually, my point is that uh, the reconstruction of the so-called American civil religion underta uh, undertaken by Robert Bella and his followers uh, is a key to understand the modern Russian ideology, which is, in effect, a uh, civil religion. Uh, and it is not a new phenomenon. I believe that the modern Russian civil religion as it is constructed uh, by Putin, uh, is a continuation of other civil religions. I think things like the ideology of the Third Rome, a posterior ideology of Samodzhavia uh, Pravoslavia Narodnost by uh, Arakcheyev, were a kind of civil religion which comprised the political elements and religious elements. Uh, in Russia, the civil religion always was always constructed with the input, significant input of the church, starting with the, uh, with the uh, elders of Pskov, uh, who contributed to the emergence of the Third Rome ideology, and um, 
finishing with, with the today's situation where the church has contributed significantly, if not, it has not made the most significant contribution to creation of the new civil religion. So this, uh, this is a difference between the Russian civil religion and the American civil religion. The American civil religion, as it is known, was, con was constructed by the father founders of the, of, of the United States. Uh, who contemplated some religious elements, but they were Unitarians, some of them, they were really, uh, they tried to uh, kind of abbreviate the, uh, the ethical system of the Protestant confession that they belonged to. The Russian uh, civil religion is constructed by the church, not by the politicians. The politicians just borrow it from the church. and reconstruct it, tailor it to, to their own whims. Uh, so this neo-Soviet civil religion is a strange thing because it features otherwise incompatible elements of the old Russian imperial ideology, communism in its hardest Stalinist edition, Orthodox Christianity, etc. The saints, well the saints of the American civil religion are known, well they are Lincoln, they are George Washington, Jefferson, and so forth. The saints of the Russian religion, they are rather incompatible. They are Nicholas II, Tsar, Stalin, uh, well, who else? <laughs> well, he is an alive prophet of it, uh, still. But, I mean, they are really, they are different. And that is another striking difference between the two phenomena. Um, like in the case of the American civil religion, which was well invented in order to legitimize the new American government vis-a-vis -vis the British uh, government, the Russian civil religion also is called to legitimize the current regime. So the, the role, the function of any civil religion is to give legitimacy to the political regime. So this one, the Russian one, is constructed for, this, for the same purpose. Um, and uh, again, the entire post-Soviet, the so-called post-Soviet space is being proselytized with this religion. This neo-Soviet political religion is at the core of the conservative international, which Moscow tries to, tries to sell to the West. Um, and this is another uh, kind of new turn in the development of the civil religion, which which now goes international somehow, and has has actually quite a, a a bunch of subscribers to it in the West. The neo-Soviet model, which is being legitimized by the corresponding civil religion, is extremely profitable for those, and that is uh, that is you know the fine fine script, which matters uh, when people sell sell it. Well. It, ex it is extremely profitable for those who have access to the political power. It is designed to convert political authority to wealth. Therefore, when in 2009 Mr. Yanukovych won the presidential office, he became one of the zealous adepts of this model and its religion. As a result, he and his family have turned fabulously wealthy. As for the rest of the people, they became significantly poorer, are completely dependent on those with political power and deprived of the rudiments of the social justice that they had had before. However, people came to the Maidan to protest not so much personally against the president and his family, but against the system, which Mr. Yanukovych supported and perfected. One of the most famous slogans of the Maidan was, I think, Nas Dostalo. We've been fed up. Uh, Maidan thus accumulated protests against the political model which had become dominant in the former Soviet republics. It was essentially, Maidan was essentially anti-Soviet, or better to say anti-neo-Soviet. Symbolical in this regard is that the protesters <coughs> took care to pull down as many monuments of Lenin as they could. 
At the core of the social conflict that the Maidan embodied was not so much a tension between pro-Western and pro-Russian orientation of the country, as many, I think, Western media misleadingly presented it, but a tension between those who are against and those who are for the neo-Soviet model of development of the Ukrainian nation. This was, Maidan was actually, a conflict between two perceptions of citizenship. The one which inclines to the Soviet-style paternalism and the other that values personal responsibility and dignity of the human person. That's why I think the majority of the protesters on, on the Maidan were Russian-speaking, particularly from uh, those who were from Kyiv. And they were protesting not against the Russian language or Russia, they were protesting against the Soviet um, against the coming back to the USSR. This explains an, ex an, an unexpectedly violent reaction of the Russian president to the victory of the Maidan. The Maidan has seriously challenged the socio-political system which he has constructed in Russia and meticulously cultivated in other former Soviet countries. It is noteworthy that among the arguments against the Maidan is that the protesters demolished the monuments to Lenin. Actually, I saw it, you know, on the on the Russian TV. They showed some people from Russia, and they they asked asked why you, why you are against the Maidan. They said, "Well, they destroyed the the monuments to Lenin." <laughs> that was the the response. Uh, Ukraine thus demonstrates that an alternative to the neo-Soviet socio-political model is possible and it is more beneficial for the people. Exactly for this reason, uh, is, uh, Ukraine is being punished by the president of Russia. The purpose of his aggression against Ukraine is essentially to save the, the neo-Soviet model, which is vital for his own regime. Protection of the Russian-speaking Ukrainians is just a camouflage for hitting the real problem which Mr. Putin faces. Many Russian-speaking Ukrainians, as I mentioned, are against this aggression because they feel that it is not being undertaken for their, uh, for their protection, but to preserve the socio-political model which suffocates the society. For many Russians, the aggression was unacceptable as well, um, and not just because they are against the war. They see, I mean, Russians in Russia, uh, they see the Ukrainian model based on the values of the Maidan as an alternative to the regime of Mr. Putin. For them, Ukraine is an alternative Russia, the other Russia. It demonstrates what Russia might have been without Mr. Putin. It means that the changes in Ukraine have created a powerful momentum for the changes in Russia. In 1979, uh, Vasily Aksyonov published his famous novel, The Island of Crimea, now uh, widely quoted. In this utopia, he imagined what would have happened to Crimea if the Bolsheviks did not take it. The utopian Crimea of Aksyonov was a flourishing democratic Western-style republic free of any element of Sovietism, which Aksyonov hated, actually. He was a very anti-Soviet. So, Crimea of Aksyonov was an alternative Russia. The irony is that the real Crimea nowadays seems to be completely opposite to, to the Crimea of Aksyonov. The Crimea of Mr. Putin is a sanctuary of the Soviet Union. It is Aksyonov's Russia. And today's Ukraine has become, or can become, Aksyonov's island of Crimea. Um, the calculation of Putin and his aggression against Ukraine is based on the support of those in the country who are nostalgic about the Soviet Union and subscribe to the values of the new Soviet social model. Among these values are paternalism, the cult of a powerful leader, and patriotism with the element of Nazism. Now we should come back properly to, to the anatomy of Maidan. 
Speaking about the moral strength of the Maidan, one cannot avoid addressing the issue of violence there. It is widely discussed in the Western media, and I think we need to, to address this issue, particularly by the activists from the far-right groups, like the right sector, like uh, Svoboda Party, and so forth. Originally, the Ukrainian protests were non-violent. The Maidan was, I call it, a collective Gandhi that abstained from any violence. The protesters not only refrained from violence themselves, but also tried to prevent any provocation towards violence initiated by the gangs employed by the regime. Well, actually, if you remember, the, Maidan, <coughs> the active fight phase of the Maidan started after the students were beaten on the 30th of, of November. And the Maidan, which came to, well, the people who came to Maidan on the 1st of December, could every possibility to overturn the regime on the same, on the set, on that day, if they would become violent. But they chose not to. And this actually, this created, this, this made them to stand whole winter in the Maidan and to sacrifice all those lives. So they, the people, the Maidan chose to be not violent, to remain peaceful at any price, even at the price of the lives which were sacrificed. Uh, however, after the dictatorship laws were adopted in the parliament by the party of regions and by the communists jointly, on January 16th uh, uh, this year, the protesters were forced to defend themselves. The inability of the Ukrainian opposition leaders, EU and US leadership, well, to offer a meaningful plan and to <coughs> timely introduce sanctions against the most odious figures of the regime made the Maidan, Maidan change its behavior. At the latest stage of the protests, the young activists from the far right and leftist movements demonstrated, demonstrated excessive violence. This is a matter of fact. Some of them were provocators engaged by the regime, some were youngsters who looked for adventure, some were people overwhelmed by the desire of revenge after the snipers shot down dozens of protesters. Uh, I should, should add that, well, from my experience of working in Ukraine when I was in, in, in the Office of External Relations, uh, I should say that I had uh, a, a, well a contact with with the, with SBU, the, the security service of Ukraine, and I learned that every radical group in Ukraine was under the control of this of this of the security uh, service of Ukraine. Every every group. So if we speak about the groups who exist, which existed before the Maidan, all of them were, to different extent, are under the control. And uh, this might be one of the explanations of radicalism, of the established radical groups. Uh, these radical groups did not nevertheless express the dominating mood of the Maidan majority, Maidan's majority. The core of the Maidan remained peaceful and faithful to its initial values. Among them uh, was the value of peaceability. The church has played an important role in preserving the peaceful character of the Maidan. People came to the Maidan because of the numerous abuses by the political regime, but they also felt that the regime violated something essentially human. They protested against its brutal inhumanity. And this is, I think, an important dimension of, of the upheaval, a part of the political and social agenda. It was also a, an important humanitarian human agenda in the uh, developments of, of the Ukraine. Uh, many of the protesters tried to express their feelings and their dissatisfaction uh, in religious terms. Thus, the language of dignity which the Maidan adopted became to a great extent religious and theological. 
people appealed to God's justice. They demanded the authorities to act in accordance with the commandments of God. During all three months of the protests, the people on the Maidan began and ended their day with prayers. They were actually one of the most massive religious uh, events probably in the world with thousands of people kneeling on the on the uh, literally kneeling on the square in the in the cold freezing cold and saying their prayers uh, um, permanently bishops and priests were standing on the stage of the Maidan and leading prayers uh, reading the scripture psalms and so forth uh, Thus, the Maidan, a part of being a political and social event, also became a religious phenomenon. I would say an extraordinary religious phenomenon. Without considering this aspect of the protests, any description, description and analysis of the Ukrainian protests would be incomplete. The role of the Ukrainian churches in the protests thus was not marginal, but central. It was characteristic more of the pre-modern society rather than a secularized one. This role has reflected the still highly religious character of the Ukrainian people who have high expectations from the churches and, and uh, then listen uh, attentively to their voices. In speaking of the Ukrainian churches, I mean three main Orthodox churches. The largest of them is the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, in communion with the Patriarchate of Moscow. Its name, its formal official name is just plain Ukrainian Orthodox Church without Moscow Patriarchy. And we tried, you know, we struggled to uh, to make a point that we, it's not the Moscow Patriarchate, but it is, of course, it is in communion with the Moscow Patriarchate. This is the only Ukrainian church recognized by the fellowship of the Orthodox churches worldwide. The second largest church is the Patriarchate of Kiev which was founded in 1992, and the smallest church is the Ukrainian Autocephalus Orthodox Church, which originates from the Autocephalus movement that started in 1918. There is also a Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, a Catholic Church, a Catholic Church Sui Iuris, which follows the Eastern Rite. The Ukrainian churches in the beginning of the protests were not up to the expectations of the awakening civil society. The Maidan articulated and enacted a moral code that the Ukrainian churches were supposed to uphold, but failed to do so during the formation of the political uh, regime of Yanukovych. All of them were more or less collaborating with the regime. All of them also got infected with many social diseases common for the neo-Soviet societies. During the years before the Maidan, known of the Ukrainian churches went far from the paradigm of the church-state relations, which favors a relationship with the state at the expense of relationship with the society. So I'd like to present the shifting role of the church during the Maidan through the triangle church-state society, how the orientation of the church vis-a-vis -vis the state and the society moved, shifted during the protests. Um, some of these churches were more aligned with the state, like the uh, Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate. Some were less like the Patriarchate of Kiev, but still dreaming of a closer relationship. Well, they were just jealous, jealous to, to the Moscow Patriarchate. The Greek Catholic Church, which was more than other churches advanced in its social teaching and action, nevertheless did not bother the state with moral lessons. The situation, however, <coughs> changed with the protests at the Maidan. All the churches had to reconsider their posi position in the triangle church-state society. All of them chose as a priority the relationship with the nascent civil society. They did it to different degrees though. The most active in supporting the social awakening, awakening was the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. The Patriarchate of Kiev 
was more reluctant in aligning with the protesters at the beginning, but eventually firmly supported them. For instance, it offered uh, the protesters its St. Michael's Monastery in the center of Kiev, which was turned to a hospital and a shelter for the protesters who sought protection from the riot police. The Ukrainian Orthodox Church under the Moscow Patriarchate tried to keep neutrality. There were hierarchs and priests who openly supported the regime of Yanukovych. There were also priests of this church who made a stand in favor of the Maidan. And I know personally some priests whom I know from Kyiv, they incognito went to Maidan and participated in building barricades. But they didn't declare this because, well, they were afraid that they would have consequences. Uh, nevertheless, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church under the Moscow Patriarchate eventually condemned the regime. Well, it happened simultaneously with the fall of the regime, I should say. The model of the relationship, which when the church prefers to state, uh, prefers the state to the society, is common in the post-Soviet countries. It is rooted in the traditions of the Byzantine symphony, symphonia, and was particularly en enhanced by the oppressive regimes during the Soviet period. This model, however, demonstrates weakness when society emancipates from the state. <laughs> This happened many times in the modern history and put the church to face a difficult dilemma of choosing between the state or the society. When the churches, following this traditional paradigm of symphony, choose the state and not the society, they later or earlier face marginalization and growing anti-clericalism. There are fears that that is what what the Russian church will have to face very soon, when if <coughs> the Russian society will emancipate from, from the regime, from the political regime. And actually it is, it is widely discussed among the priests in, and bishops in the Russian church. I know about those discussions, they are, though they are not you know, on the surface, but they are really afraid, they realize that if regime falls, they will have to pay. This was the dilemma which the Ukrainian churches faced during the most tense weeks of the uh, confrontation between the Maidan and the regime of Yanukovych. The hardest choice had to make the Ukrainian Orthodox Church in unity with the Moscow Patriarchate, which was famous for its support of the regime. The circumstances of this church were similar to the circumstances of the Orthodox Church of Greece in the period of the military junta which lasted from 1967 to 1974, and I find a, a striking similarity between the situation in Ukraine and in Greece 40 years ago. Uh, the motives of the regimes of Yanukovych and of the Greek colonels were different, of course, but the methods of establishing dictatorship were similar. Both usurped power, changed the constitution, subdued courts, relied on the law enforcement agencies to suppress dissidents and established eventually authoritarianism. A particular striking similarity is that the Greek junta ended after the student insurgents in the Polytechnic University of Athens, the so-called Polytechnio, in November 1973. The Maidan came to its active phase after the students of Kiev were beaten on the night of the 30th of November, exactly 40 years after. And it took approximately five or six months after the Politechnio in Greece before the fall of the regime. And it took, well, less than three months in our case that they went. Both, both the Greek junta and the government of Yanukovych declared themselves close to the church. There is another striking similarity. And protecting the interests of the church. Both, however, violated the basic rules of the church. Thus, the junta forced the resignation of an old and ill archbishop of Athens, Chrysostomos II, Hadzistavru, and promoted instead a young archimandrite, Hieronymus Kotsonis, as the primate of the church. It replaced the canonical synod of the church with the uncanonical so-called Aristidan synod. 
The junta also replaced the bishops it disliked and promoted the candidates whom it liked. So under the pretext of, you know, protecting the church and, and the Christian values in the society, the junta violated everything which, which it could uh, concerning the internal freedom and regulations of the church. Something similar the Ukrainian regime intended for the Ukrainian churches. As early as in his first presidential campaign in 2004, which he lost as the result of the Orange Revolution, Yanukovych relied on the support of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church in unity with the Moscow Patriarchate. The church then actively participated in his campaign. Actually, I came to Ukraine soon after those events, and I, I know a lot about you know that kind of cooperation, how many millions were paid by the regime, and actually one of the I should say, I, I should properly should say this off records, but I can say it on record as well. Um, from the beginning, I know this for sure, uh, the project of Yanukovych was promoted by some uh, oligarchs who pretended to be Orthodox. Among them were, for instance, Gennady Vasilyev and uh, Viktor Nusinkis from Donbass, from Donetsk area, and they purposely promoted Yanukovych because he was connected with Staryt Zasima from, uh, from the east of Ukraine because he was supposed to be orthodox and they just pushed him forward. The idea was that Vasilyev, uh, well Musinkis wanted Vasilyev to become a prime minister under Yanukovych, it didn't happen, but well, it was the initial idea. Um, and um, the church actively participated in the, in the events of, well, in the campaign of 2004. Um, in 2000, well, when Yanukovych won the presidential elections in 2009, he declaratively supported the Ukrainian Orthodox Church under the Moscow Patriarchate. In 2012, however, when the unofficial campaign for his re-election in 2015 started, he began intervene, intervening into the affairs of the uh, Ukrainian church, apparently with the purpose to secure its support in, th in 2015. His pressure was not very visible, but it was fierce. fierce. Probably I will tell, tell this for the first time, uh, what was under, you know, under the carpet at the time, uh, because I was present in the in these developments um, and I should say that uh, from April 2012 Yanukovych decided to replace the primate of the church metropolitan Volodymyr Sabodan with his own candidate he just summoned, summoned some of his closest people and he said I want another person another white klobuk near me just, I just wanted you know by the Trabnevi uh, Sveta by the 9th of, of May. Do, do whatever you, you want to do, but I want this done. And they, they started, you know, forcing Metropolitan Volodymyr to, to resign. And the, the reason was exactly because they wanted to secure the support of the church uh, in the wake of the presidential, uh, upcoming presidential elections. <coughs> and it was actually controlled personally, it was under the personal control of, of Lovachkin, the, the head of the presidential office at the, of the time. Uh, fortunately, Metropolitan Volodymyr did not yield to the pressure of the president, and despite his health problems, retained his position. A part, a part of this, Yanukovych appointed an oligarch who served as a supervisor, Smotryashi of the U Ukrainian Orthodox Church on behalf of the regime. Such an official observes, uh, observers were appointed by the regime in other spheres of the Ukrainian society and economy. They were loyal personally to him and had more authority than the official representatives. Say, uh, such an observer in any region, <coughs> Zaporizhia, Dnipropetrovsk, uh, had more authority on, on the economy of the region than the officially appointed administered uh, governors of, of the region. 
So the same model was applied to the church, and Yanukovych appointed such an observer, well, ironically, it means the same as bishop, <laughs> episcopus, uh, who is a layman, a layman to uh, control the church. Well, I didn't <coughs> intend to men mention his name in this paper, but I should say it was um, Vadim Novinsky. Um, it is a bit. It was a bit tricky because Novinsky actually uh, pr promoted himself to this position. He wanted to become such a such a person, and the, his role, this role of him, was accepted by by the presidential office. Um, so this was effectively a mafia model, uh, and I, as I was explained by some people in the in the Ukrainian business. They restructured the, the complete Ukrainian economy uh, according to the model of, uh, you know, criminals, upshak. So the, the economy functioned like upshak. And the same principles of mafia, they apply to different spheres, including the church. Um, so this person who was appointed to be a bishop of the church, a mafia bishop of the church, often stepped into the affairs of the church and arranged them according to his whims. His activities violated the internal regulations of the church and its freedom. Yanukovych demonstrated hostility towards other Ukrainian churches as well, particularly to the Greek Catholic Church. The government of Yanukovych started pressing the Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv as early as in May 2010, this pressure reached its peak in January 2014, when the Ministry of Culture wrote uh, to the primate of the church, Archbishop Svetoslav Shevchuk, a letter warning him that this church could be deprived of, of the state registration. All the Ukrainian churches thus became victims of the regime of Yanukovych. All of them had reasons to condemn this re regime. Not all of them, however, did this. The Ukrainian Orthodox Church, in unity with the Moscow Patriarchate, despite all, all pressure, pressure on its leadership, did not demonstrate any dissatisfaction with the regime. When, even when the regime started cracking down on the protests. The behavior of this church, as I mentioned earlier, uh, was similar to the Greek church, which aligned, which had aligned with the regime of the colonels and kept a blind eye on numerous violations of laws and human rights in Greece. However, after the collapse of the junta in 1974, the Greek church, as a result, lost a good deal of its credibility in the Greek society. Even after 40 years, this church is still accused of collaborationism with the dictatorship. I started, started for five years in Athens in Greece, and I witnessed many times how the church suffered for, from the marginaliz marginalization which it was responsible itself because of its colla uh, colla collaborationism with the, uh, with the junta of, of the colonels in Greece. So the Ukrainian Orthodox Church was to face the same consequences. In the last moment, however, it changed, fortunately, its attitude to the regime and distanced from it. The church condemned the violence of the regime and eventually aligned with the society, probably the last among the churches. Uh, moreover, it became a protagonist in the struggle for the territorial integrity of Ukraine after the Russian invasion. It used its special ties with the Russian ecclesial and political leadership to urge it to de-escalate the situation. The locum tenants of the church, Metropolitan Onufri, who was uh, elected as a locum tenants immediately after the change of the regime, because Metropolitan Vladimir is really very, very ill and cannot function. So it was kind of... This happened not under the pressure of Yanukovych, though Yanukovych wanted this to have something like this to happen, but it happened because of the really bad condition of Metropolitan Vladimir. So Onufri was 
elected as locum tenens, and he said, sent soon a letter to the Patriarch of Moscow, Kirill, and the President of Russia, calling on them to avoid a military conflict with, conflict with Ukraine and to preserve <coughs> the territorial integrity of the country. The Ukrainian Orthodox Church under the Moscow Patriarchate, in contrast to the rest of the Ukrainian churches, which are confined mostly to the western parts of the country, geographically covers the entire country, including Crimea. It is the only church and one of a few social institutions that can outreach the decent parts of the divided nations. nation. Actually, the Ukrainian church is now the only institution of Ukraine that survived in Crimea. Other, other institutions are gone. Only the church remains, and uh, the last synod in Moscow, which discussed the Ukrainian situation, there were fears that the synod in Moscow would take the dioceses from in Crimea and put them under, under Moscow directly, but it didn't happen so formally at least. The dioceses are still under, under Kiev, and this is the only, as I said, institution, Ukrainian institution surviving in, in, in Crimea. And I think this should be somehow appreciated and even used. Uh, so by bridging west, east, north and south of Ukraine, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church can atone for its collaborationism with the regime of Yanukovych. Uh, during the three months of the protests, the Ukrainian churches matured in their stand vis-a-vis -vis the social and moral issues that the Maidan attempted to resolve. They appreciated the non-violent character of the protests and enhanced this character of the Maidan. They gradually supported the moral agenda of the protests and gave them theological legitimacy. They also re-evaluated re their relationship with the state. In the triangle church-state society, they chose to align with the latter. Although this reorientation has happened in the history of the Eastern churches before, it is not common for them. The realignment of the Ukrainian churches with this society at the expense of the relationship with the political regime enhanced an alternative pattern of the relations of the Eastern Christian churches with the state. So in this regard, Ukraine is really pioneering in, in, in promoting, creating, promoting a new model of the relations of the church with the society instead of a relationship just with the state. So this pattern became inclusive of the society. Moreover, the Ukrainian ca case demonstrates that the Eastern churches can go further than just supporting the interests of the people. In the past, <clears throat> this sort of support was often embodied in the form, forms of nationalism. Nationalism, nationalization of the church, was a kind of alignment of the church with the society. When the society was really concerned about national issues, agendas. Uh, and as a result, nationalism of the local churches became a characteristic feature of the Eastern Christianity in the last one and a half centuries. The churches became identified with the nation, with the national agenda, agendas. However, during the recent events in Ukraine, the churches did not identify themselves with the national groups only but also with the civil interests of the society. And this is a new thing, that uh, the interests of the society are regarded by the churches, not only in national terms nowadays, owing to the Ukrainian developments, but also the civil interests, the citizenship, became an important feature of this identification of the church with the society. And this is a completely new thing, at least in the, in the Eastern Christian tradition. It is not a new thing in the Western Christian traditions, but it is quite new for us. Uh, maybe this identification with the interests of, interests of the civil society will not survive, and the churches will return to identifying themselves with the national interests only, which is a reduction of the social agenda of the church. But nevertheless, the Maidan has shown that identification of the Orthodox churches with the civil society is possible and 
it can be beneficial for both the church and the society. There are many ways how the Orthodox churches can facilitate the growth of the civil society in the countries affected by the totalitarianism and post-totalitarian syndromes. These syndromes cannot be healed without a deep desovitization of these societies. Civil society in the countries like Ukraine can mature uh, can maturate only if the majority of the people get rid of the Soviet-style paternalism, assume a full responsibility for their future, uh, value freedom, and learn to use its responsibility as responsibly. They need to refuse the services of their great inquisitors. The inquisitor in Dostoevsky's brothers, brothers Karamazov is a typical ruler of a neo-Soviet sta state who takes from his subjects the burden of freedom, regardless of whether they want it or not. The, the majority of the post-Soviet people uh, feel happy when they are paternalized by the state and when they uh, rent their freedom to the great inquisitor. Uh, the churches in Ukraine and other post-Soviet countries should clearly state that refusal of freedom is, excuse me, is sin, just as greed or pride. They can become a school which teaches their members to exercise their freedom through developing relationship with God and with the neighbor. This makes churches indispensable in addressing the social, social issues pertinent to the post-Soviet milieu because they can hit the core of these issues, the fear and refusal to exercise freedom. On January 3rd, 2014, The Guardian uh, published a letter called Support the Ukrainian, Ukrainians and they can help us build a fair Europe, which was signed by the leading world intellectuals. They wrote that, I quote, today, the Ukrainian Maidan represents Europe as its, uh, at its best. What many thinkers in the past and present assume to be fundamental European values, end of quote. They su suggested that, I quote again, Ukraine needs a European Marshall-like plan that would ensure its transformation into a full democracy and society with guaranteed civil rights, end of quote. Well, more and more people, of course, as we know, uh, uh, speak nowadays uh, on, the, uh, marsh on a Marshall plan for Ukraine. But we should remember that the original Marshall plan for the after-war uh, Europe presupposed condemnation of the ideologies that led to fascism and Nazism. Something similar we need in Ukraine. Ukraine, after having received its independence, did not get rid of the communist past as radically as, for instance, the Baltic and the Central European countries did. This past still haunts the country. The regime of the Party of Regions, in coalition with its ally, the Communist Party, led the Soviet element of the Ukrainian society ad absurdum. Well, for me personally, Mr. Azarov was a kind of embodiment, you know, incarnation of the Soviet past. I think he, he thought the same. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, this reduction ad absurdum of these Soviet elements in the Ukrainian society now gives us a chance to eradicate this element altogether. And the role of the Ukrainian churches in eradication of the Sovietisms in the society can be similar to the role of the churches in the post-war Germany, where society was, was also deeply traumatized by Nazism. Uh, Heike uh, Springhardt, in her book Aufbrüche zu neuen Ufern, has described how the post-war Germany, uh, German society was re-educated with the assistance of the Christian churches. This example is relevant to the situation in Ukraine. Although the, the German churches in their majority collaborated with the NSDAP and uh, were themselves affected by the Nazi theolo ideology, they were the only social institution with the potentiality to heal the wounds caused by Nazism. They were those relatively clear zones, areas of the wounded German soul that could be expanded to the entire society. 
This followed actually a technique suggested by the American psychiatrist Richard Brickner, uh, who lived, who died in 1985. His psychiatric technique became extremely popular during the war period and was used, ex uh, employed in, in Germany uh, to heal the entire nation, actually. So according to this technique, a relatively healthy area of a damaged brain can be extended to the entire mind. The German churches were chosen as such relatively healthy areas to be extrapolated to the entire German, German psyche. The church, because of its divine component, as we believe, Christians believe, can overcome its own historical shortcomings and thus can force the society towards recovery. The churches can do something similar in Ukraine. Even though the Ukrainian churches have been affected by the Soviet totalitarianism and post-Soviet neo-totalitarianism, which has become particularly embodied in the regime of Yanukovych, they can serve as those clear areas to provide healing to the Ukraine, Ukrainian psyche. For this, they need to tune up their social and political behavior in accordance with their nature and mission. Of course, here we should be realists. The Ukrainian churches, some of them have become and can be kind of reserves of the Soviet past. Quite surprisingly, because the church in the Soviet past was more or less against the Soviet regime. It was a kind of soft opposition to the regime. And in some cases, nowadays, the church preserves that Soviet past. It's a kind of island, an island of the Soviet past. But the church, I believe, has the potentiality to be just the opposite, to heal the wounds, the Soviet you know, diseases of the, uh, the post-Soviet minds and societies. Uh, another historical precedent on which the Ukrainian churches can build their work is, is South Africa, with its experience of, of overcoming apartheid. The system of segregation between the two parts of the South African society was established with the assistance of the churches, uh, like for instance uh, NGK, the Nederduitse Gere for Merde Kerk, it's in Afrikaans. The churches also helped to demolish the apartheid. So the churches helped to build apartheid and the churches helped to demolish it on the same hand, on, on the other hand. Uh, this happened more, mostly under the umbrella of the South African Council of Churches, the SACC, with a, a particular input from uh, the Archbishop Desmond Tutu, Nobel Prize winner. The role of the, and he was a very close friend of Nelson Mandela, and he was extremely important for Nelson Mandela because Desmond Tutu, as a friend of Mandela, was probably the only person in so South Africa who, who, who could, you know, kick the door of Mandela. Uh, rush in and shout on Mandela, what, what are you doing, you know, and Mandela heard, heard, and this input was extremely important, the role of, of Tutu in, in, you know, in overcoming all the problems of apartheid. Um, so uh, the churches and, and Desmond Tutu, particularly, did this on the basis of the traditional African concept of Ubuntu. It's an interesting African concept which uh, was creatively adapted to the Christian theology, and it means uh, humanness, actually. It means reconciliation and the value of human dignity, something similar to what the Maidana, Maidan stood for. Uh, these features of Ubuntu are exactly what is needed now in Ukraine. That's why I believe this, uh, the South African post-apartheid experience, experience is extremely important for Ukraine. Um, the divided country, like Ukraine, needs a third way between Nuremberg and national amnesia, as Desmond Tutu has described in his book no future without forgiveness, and I like this, you know, th third way, because in Ukraine, of uh, uh, definitely we need a Nuremberg. We need to, well, Lustratze, what they call Lustratze. But again, as we see now, and I myself, I was very much in favor of, you know, Ukrainian Nuremberg. But as we see now, a proper Nuremberg can divide the country further. 
So a third way definitely is needed. And I think this is, this is another um, reason why we should uh, harvest from the experience of South Africa. In conclusion, the Maidan has created a new national narrative which will form the identity of the future generations of the Ukrainians. Uh, this narrative consists of many stories of heroism, altruism, and sacrifice. The Nebesna uh, Sotnya, the heavenly uh, centurion, uh, will, uh, will be a, an important part of this narrative, of course. And it, this narrative will strengthen not only the national identity of the Ukrainian people, but also, I believe, its civil priorities. So the new uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the national narrative that existed before before the Maidan was based mostly on the events of the 16th, 17th century, Cossacks and you know Bogdan Khmelnytsky and so forth. <clears throat> of course, it was distilled, idealized through the prism of the Romanticists of the 19th century, uh, and it was effective in building a nation, in building a nation, but not an a civil society. Uh, its update, which happened owing to the Maidan, will focus on building a more just and human habitat for the Ukrainian citizens. So we are speaking about creation of a new national narrative, which will, which has been updated to include, to embrace the issues of citizenship, the civil society, and the Ukrainian churches became an important part of this new narrative. Their role in transformation of a post-totalitarian society to a more human place and democracy has been exceptional. Um, and this is an interesting um, contrast to what happened in, in most European countries where the civil society, in order to, be, to survive, had to struggle to wrestle with the churches, particularly with the Catholic Church. In Ukraine, it might have happened, but it didn't happen, because the civil society is being born with the assistance of the churches. Well, in other words, well, to use another analogy, uh, the churches were attempted to commit an abortion of the civil society. Instead, they chose to be present at the delivery of the civil society. So the images of the priests leading prayers and standing with their people under the bullets of snipers will be on the pages of the textbooks about the new Ukraine. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Otsa Kirillo, for these both, you know, uh, very interesting, insightful, informational and analytical points, but informed so interestingly and for us unusually with insights from your religious background, theological and philosophical uh, insights, uh, which I think should provide us with a lot of material for uh, discussion. And uh, first, let me ask whether there are any, okay, we have one hand up already, and then another hand. And then, okay, so we'll go in batches of three or four. <coughs> Nat Natya, then Helena, Peter, and Andri. I have a question. And uh, just, uh, I, I know it may have been difficult maybe for you to hear from this side, but it is difficult for us to hear right. from this side. I'll try to be more articulate. And loud. Loud. So yeah. um, what I'm curious about is more current, and specifically, what is the relationship currently between um, the leaders of the Ukrainian Church of Mos mm -hmm. Moscow Patriarchate in Kyiv and, um, uh, and uh, authorities in Moscow? So what is the relationship at the moment, given the yeah. active position that the church has taken up now? Well, they're complex, <coughs> obviously. They combine personal and formal relationships. Uh, nowadays, I think we should speak about collective leadership in the Ukrainian church. Metropolitan Volodymyr is, is ill. Uh, he, of course, before he came to Ukraine, he was an important figure in the Moscow Patriarchate. But I think uh, his relationship with the, with Moscow during the last years, particularly, were tense. 
uh, speaking about uh, Onufri, well, Onufri is he played a, a crucial role, a key role in the separation of the in the division of the church uh, in 1992. He was he was one of the bishops who uh, he stood uh, against Filaret and he stood for uh, for the Ukrainian Church to be in unity with the Moscow Patriarchate. Uh, but I would not say that he is a pro-Moscow uh, hierarch. Well, purely, of course, he has uh, uh, different kinds of, of relationships and 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 and, uh, and contacts with Moscow. Well, in recent years, I think he had even more contacts with the United States because he has some relatives staying here, and he comes here, and he speaks. He's very fluent in English, actually. When we communicated with him, he always tried to speak with me in English. When I tried to switch to to back to Ukrainian, he know he said no. Let us speak in English. So, it, uh, so he's he's not that simple. I mean, pro-Russian as he's believed to be, though, of course, he has kind of relationship with, with Moscow. Uh, he's now in, the, in a difficult situation because he was just elected as a locum tenens and he faced very hard, a very hard situation and he has to make very, very <coughs> difficult decisions. Uh, so far, I think he handled it uh, not bad because he wrote a letter to Putin, he wrote a letter to Patriarch Kirill, uh, he signed and he participated actively in uh, adopting the common documents of the uh, all Ukrainian Council of, uh, of the Churches and Religious Organizations, the Ukrainian Rada Cerkov Religijnych Organizacji, which is actually the only effective uh, ecumenical platform for the Ukrainian churches and Jewish and Muslim organizations in Ukraine, and which has um, adopted a number of import important documents in support of the integrity of the country, against the aggression, uh, in support of the government, uh, against the background of, you know, uh, uh, of doubts about legitimacy of, of, uh, of, of the government expressed by Russia. So that those documents, all those, the package of the documents, which became crucially important for legitimization of the government and legi legitimization of the struggle for the integrity of Ukraine, <coughs> me, <coughs> that package was adopted by the uh, All Ukrainian Council, and it happened because all the churches rotate in their leadership in the council that this this time. This year, the Ukrainian Church under the Moscow Patriarchate is in, in the leadership, is presiding over the Council. So all the documents of the Council uh, were promulgated with the signature of Onufri. So it is ambivalent. I mean, it is it is multi-dimensional this kind of relationship and position of Onufri. But we we need to see. Yet we need to have more time to see how we, how, how he will behave and react. Uh, even more, this applies to Antoni, who, who was one of the leaders before Nufri, who, who was a, a, a kind of manager of the church. He was even more pro-Ukrainian, and he was uh, uh, more, you know, pro-Russian government. Though his problem was that he uh, worked too close with Yanukovych. Helena Hri, please. I have a, a comment and then I guess many questions, but I'll leave my question to one. Uh, the comment is, it was very in interesting, your um, analysis of, uh, of civil religion mm -hmm. and the role of the church. And I just wanted to add um, maybe a third, um, a, a third mm -hmm. example that, that's applicable to the Ukrainian case, perhaps not so much to do with the state, but with the nation. Yeah is uh, we have um, one of our professors who's uh, finishing a book on Taras Shevchenko okay. and the analysis of the work and I guess one of the points that he's uh, coming to is in fact, you know, Shevchenko's work is, is, is his definition of Ukraine really as something sacred yeah. and in fact the Ukrainian nation building is a type of, uh, of a civil religion Absolutely. as well. So Absolutely. that's just sort of a, an addition agree. To, that, yeah. to that very interesting comment. Um, I guess the other question I have is, um, 
You know, I, I wanted to congratulate you. It's, it's very, uh, it's a really a brilliant position paper for the role of the church in, in Ukrainian society for the future. And, uh, you know, very often, I guess, in our minds, we don't um, sort of think of Ukrainian churches in general as being particularly powerful intellectually. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a very impressive example. How uh, representative is this position? I mean, uh, Ukrainian institutions are essentially in ruins now you yeah. know, from the state. Yeah. Are you representative? Is there, pot uh, is there potential for it? Is just something to build? And how much of the, of the church is, I guess, is it particularly your church? Yeah. What are the chances of this becoming really the, yeah. the program for your church? Well, it's, it's really it's a difficult question. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> well, I should say that Properly, it is not representative. But uh, I think that um, I know for sure that uh, uh, quite a number of people whom I know in the Ukrainian church, uh, they would share and they, they do share uh, these thoughts. I, tried, I just try to, you know, to systematize them, to, to, to put them more uh, academically somehow. Uh, and I hope that a lot of work needs to be done in order to uh, to make this idea working. And actually, one of uh, of the ideas which are, which 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 are now discussing uh, <clears throat> is about to uh, to have a kind of project which which we are discussing this with uh, with some university partners in 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 Canada and in Scandinavia uh, uh, to. create a discipline what, of what we call public ecclesiology or political ecclesiology that would <coughs> enable, which, which would act as a kind of mediator between the church and the society, which would, which would act like you know, a transmission block in the machine which turns the power, transformative power of the church to make the society change. Uh, I think it is possible. <laughs> I'm not too optimistic about this, but I think there is a chance that the church, the churches, can be enacted, uh, engaged into into this process, and can really exercise impact through some some uh, mechanisms like the one that we are discussing of of, of setting up in Ukraine nowadays. I was wondering if you had like an institutional link to the government, some sort of religious strategic institute under the auspices of the uh, government, because no. these things are all very, Pre very, no. thank you, very, very important though. That well, would be we, a, a good place to start. Yeah. Well, actually, uh, it, it has been discussed for a long time. I remember when uh -huh. I was still in, in, in Kiev, uh, we had a very nice uh, talk with Yulia Timoshenko. Mm -hmm. I was quite you know, related to, to her at the time. And uh, we had this discussion in, uh, in the cabinet in the office of Metropolitan Law Gamer. And I suggested, oh, what if we, we create a kind of uh, uh, think tank at the government, uh, which would include also people from the church. This idea, well, she said that she liked this idea, but she likes every idea, of course. Uh, so there were discussions how to, you know, uh, to engage the church more actively in the political and social processes, most importantly social processes, because we don't want to be a part of the political processes. Uh, we, we don't want to make a church a, the church a partisan uh, institution. Uh, but more importantly, to, um, uh, to convert the power of the church into public energy. Um, well, so far, the attempts that we had didn't work, but it does mean that this idea is not workable. So hopefully, we'll continue and we'll 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 struggle to to do at least something in order to make this possible. Peter Wolschuk, sort of following up on Helena's question, <clears throat> I read an article yesterday uh, citing people in Kiev, and I'm wondering what you see is the future of your church, the, the Moscow Patriarchate. It said that, and it cited the uh, Metropolitan of Odessa as an example, that at least a third of the hierarchs of the church, and almost as many of the faithful, are hardline pro-Moscow yeah. 
pro uh, That's very right. um, continued union with Russia, and it talked about the fact that the church potentially could face some sort of a division or mm -hmm. cynicism or Ruskom. Yeah. Uh, where do you see your church going? It's also a difficult question. Um, I think I can I can only uh, guess what may happen. There are there are several scenarios about what what could happen. Um, uh, one scenario is uh, that the things will be as they are now. Nothing will change, which is quite likely. Um, if I can jump in, then what does that do? If things stay as they are for the church engaging society. It will mean that the church will will remain disengaged from the society, and the society will be disengaged from the church. Uh, so the, the the preservation of the status quo is possible if the gap between the church and the society is preserved as well. Uh, the second scenario is that um, uh, the Ukrainian Church will declare independence autocephaly and will unite on this premise uh, as one church. That, that was our, well, our idea. Uh, I hope this rec record will not go to Moscow. Um, I think your secrets are safe. <laughs> Uh, that was the, our idea somehow, yes, to, to create the local church in Ukraine on the basis of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church in the Moscow Patriarchate as the most, uh, uh, as the largest church, because it has over 12,000 communities, which is by far la larger than any other Ukrainian church. Um, so gradually to develop the churches so that they could unite on the basis of the Ukrainian church and the Ukrainian church could become independent. Nowadays this scenario is, is, seems to be unrealistic as well because exactly uh, there is a group of hierarchs and a group of faithful who would never uh, comply with this, uh, with this scenario, but, which means that uh, a third scenario is possible that the Ukrainian church will be split I will split into two ch two parts. One would go to would remain in Moscow, and the other one would become independent or go under the Ecumenical Patriarchate, which is also an option. Which means that then Ukraine will be ecclesially divided into two parts: one part under the Moscow Patriarchate and mm -hmm. the other part under the Patriarchate of Constantinople, which of course enhance the division of the country mm -hmm. uh, even further. Actually, it was uh, my rationale when in 2004, when to, in 2008, as you remember, maybe during the celebrations of of, uh, uh, of 1,020 years from baptism of Kiev, uh, Patriarch, Patriarch Bartholomew came to Moscow, to Kiev, excuse me, um, and there were plans to uh, to proclaim, uh, to recognize by the Ecumenical Patriarchate uh, uh, the Patriarchate of Kiev and the Autocephalous Church. I should confess that at that time I was somehow responsible for, for this visit on behalf of the Ukrainian Church. I was against this scenario. Uh, and I said why? Because first, it would inevit inevitably create split within the uh, world orthodoxy. The two parts of the orthodox world would be just go apart. Moscow and Constantinople. It will be a major disaster for, for the Orthodox world. And second, because this will, would create uh, a split in Ukraine. Ukraine would go into two parts. And this would lead to, to the scenario which we are witnessing now. Um, uh, my idea at that time was that we need to strengthen the Ukrainian Orthodox Church and to make it departing gradually from Moscow. And thus to create, to build gradually a one single church which would preserve also the integrity of the country. This scenario didn't work. I should confess this. Uh, so what, what would be the, the solution? That's why from the beginning I said I don't know what would be the best scenario. And I don't know what, what, what scenario would be, would be workable in Ukraine. Probably because of, of uh, improbability of each 
scenario, the status quo will remain, will will be there still. Uh, I don't know. Again, everything will develop will, will depend on the developments in Ukraine now with the Russian aggression aggression and uh, well, we'll see what will remain from Ukraine. If I could follow up with one further question. Right, very quickly. Um, mm -hmm. What do you see the role of the Moscow Patriarchate? Because the Ukrainian church is almost half of the total believers and the total number of parishes. Yeah. Are they going to sit by quietly while no. the Ukrainian church no. tries to no do way. it? No way. Could I add a, sort yeah, of sure. a footnote to that yeah. question? There were uh, sort of rumors when Patriarch Kirill started visiting Ukraine quite frequently mm -hmm. that he might, uh, for example, transfer his residence for half the year from Moscow to Kiev and therefore assume de facto personal uh, jurisdiction over the Ukrainian uh, Orthodox Church. And what would that mean even not for autocephaly but for the autonomous status that the Church possesses today? Yes, there were uh, ideas like this uh, which were discussed uh, both publicly and uh, um, uh, and privately among the bishops in the churches. Um, this didn't happen. Uh, it is unlikely that this would happen now. Uh, what is more likely to happen from the perspective of Moscow that the Ukrainian church would be divided. And uh, a part of it, uh, as, they, as they see it, would, would stay on the territories controlled by, by Moscow. And the other parts, well, they realize that they cannot preserve the entire church, though, well, they, they will do everything possible to preserve under their control the entire church, but they realize that there is a, a, a risk that uh, they could not uh, do control this. the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they need to sacrifice at least something in order to get control over the other side. Uh, of course, the party, particularly presided by Metropolitan Rafael <coughs> Odessa, was to um uh to reverse the, the even the status quo the uh, the rights of the ukrainian church which it, it which which it enjoys now the semi autonomous church whatever it means uh and to reverse it to the status of exarchate which it had mm -hmm. before before the independence of, of the country uh, i'm quite sure that those moves by metropolitan agapano were inspired from elsewhere, uh, but yes, a, a good deal of the bishops and uh, a, a significant party, with the party within the Ukrainian Church, uh, entertained and still entertains this idea. Andrei Ivanov and then Tatiana Boryak. Uh, from what I understand, can you hear me there? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, uh, but do try to speak up okay. a little bit. Uh, Ukraine today is the uh, first country in the history of the Slavic world uh, whose head of state, the current head of state, is a Protestant, yeah. Turchina. I wanted to ask you, um, can you tell us more about the role of the uh, non-Orthodox, non-Catholic Christians on the Maidan yeah. and in the civil movement in Ukraine? Yeah, well, I think th there is no a different pattern of their behavior on the Maidan from the Orthodox churches. The same, I think, the same activity and the same active participation uh, in the events, in the in the protests. Um, and the only thing they their voices could not be heard as loudly as the voices of the Orthodox churches. They, they uh, actively participated in the decision making and in, the, you know, in uh, promulgating different uh, 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 statements through the old Ukrainian council of the churches and religious organizations. And this is, includes also Jews and, and Muslims, um, as I mentioned. Um, uh, so typologically, the behavior of the uh, non smaller churches, so to say, uh, was the same. The role of Turchinov, yes, uh, uh, I knew him personally quite well before, well, when he was still in, in uh, a right hand of Timoshenko and we had discussions about vision of the Ukrainian church uh, as, as such at large, 
one Ukrainian church, Orthodox church with him. Uh, of course, he supported this idea. And uh, I tried, you know, I tried to sell him the idea of the Ky Kievan church. He didn't like it as a, as a Baptist because, well, he felt maybe excluded because Baptists were not a part of the church under, under Knyaz Volodymyr. But generally, he was quite, uh, quite supportive. And I think his role is, is extremely uh, important uh, because uh, his, his policy, personal policies, are somehow relevant to his values. He's quite, I mean, he's a devoted Baptist and uh, he's not a hypocrite, I'm, I'm quite sure. Um, his role as an acting president, being a Baptist, means that the pattern of the the religious map of Ukraine typologically is different from say from the religious map of Russia because Ukraine is diverse and Ukraine real has realized its diversity religious diversity no one church including the Moscow Patriarchate Church uh, pretends to be a monopolist in Ukraine it is impossible uh, I mean physically but also it has been accepted that, that Ukraine is diverse and it should be, more, more importantly, it should be diverse, it should be pluralistic. Um, and that, as I said, typologically, it is a radical, a dramatic difference uh, in comparison with the situation in Russia, where Russia also started, began as after, under Yeltsin as a, a diverse, as a, as a pluralistic uh, sit, uh, situation in terms of religion, but then it it came to the idea of, of you know monopoly of the church. Um, so the fact that Turchinov is an acting president was accepted by the church as uh, being a Baptist as an acting president as a leader, a political leader, exactly uh, stems from this. Uh, acknowledgement by the churches of the diversity of Ukraine. Tatiana? Um, I have two questions if I can My first question is about the, the union of the two churches, uh, Orthodox churches, mm -hmm. so Kiev and, and Moscow Patriarchate. So, as far as I understood, you mentioned a little bit. So, you think that it, it's not possible, or what is the position of, of both leaders, because I think the society yeah. would be glad to have just one United Orthodox Church, but it seems to be too complicated in, in terms of religion. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a good question, actually. You know, w uh, uh, six years ago, when I was in office in, in Kyiv, um, I started somehow the process of, uh, of dialoguing between the Moscow Patriarchate and Kyiv Patriarchate. Uh, then I realized that no one really is really interested in the dialogue, in the rapprochement, in the unification of the church. Though there was a huge demand from the society for the churches to be united, a huge demand. Every message about possible unity that we sent to the society was accepted extremely well, with a great appreciation, but not from the political leaders, maybe except Yushchenko. Yushchenko was, well, I think he was quite sincerely in favor of the unification of the church, but not the rest of the political leaders. More importantly, and surprisingly, the churches themselves were not interested in this kind of rapprochement. Well, of course, they produced some kind of rhetorics, but it was just rhetorics, no real steps. Actually, after it happened in uh, 2009, September, uh, we had a synod of our church and we annun announced uh, that we would start a commission which would prepare a commission for the dialogue all with the Patriarchate of Kyiv. In a few days after this announcement, I was in Crete, I, I, I read on the internet that uh, I am removed from Kyiv to Moscow. Mm. So that was that was it, <laughs> and I'm very glad that now, under the pressure, of course, of the developments, um, 
the Synod of the Ukrainian Church has adopted a decision that they would start a dialogue, would set up a commission, not for preparation for another commission, but a commission for the dialogue with the Patriarchate of Kiev, which is a huge step. But after six years, well, I'm glad that <laughs> I will <laughs> it happened eventually. Uh, uh, though I paid, well, a rather uh, uh, huge price for that. But it happened, and I think it is, it is a positive state. The question is whether this dialogue will be an end in itself, or will eventually lead to some real dialogue, or they just, you know, meet each other and talk and each other <coughs> go and depart. Well, unofficial, of course, we, we are in perfect communication. Well, bishops, uh, priests come together, they drink their vodka, they, they chat, you know, uh, everything is fine. But uh, officially, they never uh, say a word to each other. And officially, this, this kind of context is started, and this is a good token. Uh, next on my list is Volodymyr Dibrova, who stepped out temporarily, and then Oleg. So I will take advantage of Volodymyr's absence and put a question of my own, if I may. Yeah, sure. um, I was intrigued by one thing you said when you were discussing the, uh, the position of symphonia, yeah. uh, of the cooperation of church and state, going back to the Byzantine tradition. And you said none of the four churches, that is the three Orthodox mm -hmm. jurisdictions or the Greek Catholic, yeah. was immune to that. And then you gave a kind of a a range. Yeah. And the Greek Catholic came at the end, but I was intrigued by this notion that it was also not immune, yeah. which actually is a position that I uphold, but a lot of Greek Catholics would be quite surprised yeah. at such a statement. So I was wondering what you would... Uh, what you this. had in mind. Yeah, how to prove this. Well, actually, uh, the Greek Catholic Church, I, I don't want to, you know, to uh, point my finger. No, no, finger. it's not a quick, we're trying to uh, understand these things, and yeah. it's not a question of... Well, just a few facts, for instance, yeah. they, uh, the Ukrainian Catholic University uh, accepted donation from Mr. Firtash, which was a dubious step, for instance. Mm -hmm. So they were ready to accept money from different, not quite clear sources. It does mean that we didn't, we, we did accept a lot of uh, the, the uh, dirty money. That's well. That's true. But every church. That is my point. In Ukraine, uh, did things which would be you know regarded not not quite appropriate yeah. from the American perspective. And uh, the Greek Catholic Church. It is of course it is a different typological. It is a different story because the Greek Catholic Church first. Uh, it didn't live through, uh, through the great persecutions uh, uh, of uh, 1930s, uh, something that the Orthodox churches suffered. Of course, it was completely destroyed after the uh, World War II uh, under, under the Stalin. And it had an experience of living in the underground. But what is important, the Greek Catholic Church in the last, at least in the, in the 20th century, uh, was not forced to be a servant institution to the state, something that the Orthodox Church was forced to be. So they never had this kind of experience of, of servilism to the state. Uh, moreover, the experience of, under, of being in the underground, the, the, the fact that the uh, the strength of the Greek Catholic Church was in its, in, in its people. The people were still always active because they were not uh, extinguished as, as believers under, under the Stalin. So the church went, in, went into the underground, but people were still there. And the church relied on the people. Unlike the Orthodox Church, when people in 1930s, owing to Holodomor, owing to uh, Stalin's cleansing uh, purges, uh, people were lost to the church. They became atheists, essentially, in the central, in the uh, eastern parts of Ukraine. And the church lost its touch with the people. The only point of reference for the church remained the state, and the state encouraged this. While for the Greek Catholic Church, even though in the, in the position of the underground church, they still had the point of reference, their people, they were still rooted there. And that is the difference that um, conditioned a more alignment of the Greek Catholic Church with the society in the recent, in the recent times. Uh, 
again because the people of Ukraine are the same everywhere mafia is the same in Lviv in Donetsk and so forth the people are there the church even though it is it is relying on the on the people it is relying on the people who suffer from the same moral uh, illnesses so it affects the church Thank you very much. Well, uh, I think that Volodymyr Gibrova has given up his chance, so the last word of the session goes to Oleg Kutsuba. Thank you very much. I, I can later apologize. Maybe the question was already asked. If so, I would be happy to, to withdraw it. Uh, and the question touches very much on what you just mentioned in your last uh, response about the relations between the state and the church. Mm -hmm. And what I see and a lot of other uh, scholars and civil activists see is actually an alarming de-secularization of life in Ukraine. It's very good and it's very, of course, should be supported to him that the interests of the believers uh, and their rights are protected. But so such rights also have people who are not, yeah. you know, who do not attend church or who are not who are believers. Uh, uh, the Orthodox Church and especially mm -hmm. the uh, Orthodox Church of the Moscow Church has been very um, active and very effective also in, in trying to influence the state politics in yeah. in the realms of uh, human rights in particular, uh, in the realms of the uh, uh, different legislation that um, would regulate uh, issues such as birth control, yeah. contraception, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah. The latest example is of course the legislation that should have been passed for Ukraine to sign the association agreement and it had to do with the uh, discrimination issues at workplace for uh, uh, gay people. Yeah. Um, I, I see this as a very alarming yeah. um, sign that, church, that the church tries to intervene in the state affairs to such an extent by basically trying to block any kind of such legislation that would basically provide equal rights um, mm -hmm. uh, on the level of the state, not, not within the yeah. church. How do you see this? How do you see the yeah. possible exits of the situation? Yeah, I think it should be considered in, <laughs> in a larger context of what is going on, uh, say, in Russia, where the church uh, takes, of course, a much more active position in these issues. I would say that the Ukrainian churches are much less active. They're passive in comparison with what is going on in, 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 in Moscow. They are even less... Uh, active in comparison with what the uh, churches do in the United States. I mean, the, the Catholic Church, the, uh, the religious right, and, and so forth. Um, so in this context, I wouldn't say that uh, the role, that in, the input of the, of the Ukrainian churches, because <coughs> regarding the moral issues, they have uh, they they share the same st stand in this regard about well, the voice of the Kiev Patriarchate or Moscow Patriarchate in Ukraine or the Greek Catholic Church is uh, is the same I would say um, and they agree to speak on these issues commonly uh, but again their voice is not as loud as uh, well articulated say as in in the United States or in Russia um, I would say that, and that is my point, uh, that Ukraine, this is the Ukrainian society, and uh, as, a cons as a consequence, the Ukrainian churches are more appreciating the diversity of the Ukrainian society. If we speak about the difference between Ukraine and Russia, I would, I would emphasize uh, this appreciation as a point of divergence between the Ukrainian case and the Russian case. Uh, and this regards, uh, this, uh, uh, regards many issues, including the moral issues. For instance, I remember there were discussions uh, about uh, uh, I think it, w it was about Yes, it was yeah about the gay um, uh, um, uh, uh, legislation, and uh, uh, I remember the comment of Metropolitan Volodymyr at the time. He said that well, it's not a kind of concern of the state. That's why we don't have our position 
what 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 the state should should say. Um, this proclaimed it was it was said unofficially in, in an interview in a comment. It was not put into a kind of you know document of the church. I remember how heavily he was criticized by our own religious right, uh, and still it was his position that okay, let let the state do whatever the state wants to do. Um, I could not imagine the situation in the States or, or in Russia. So I would not exaggerate this influence in, in Ukraine. I would say yes, there are some attempts to, you know, to say something just in order not to be, uh, not, not, not to look like, you know, uh, indifferent to those issues under the criticism of our own uh, political or religious activists. Um, I would not exaggerate as, as a result uh, the clerical impact on the society in Ukraine, because, well, this, the, the, the paradox in Ukraine is that the demand of the society from the church to articulate, uh, to speak on the moral issues and so forth, is much greater than the response of the church to this demand. Unlike, again, in Russia, where the demand is less, much less, than the response of the church. Sometimes the church uh, speaks more than the society needs it to speak, I would say. Can I just ask what yes. you So it seems just to me that uh, uh, maybe <coughs> you're right, uh, I, I, I want to hope that, and certainly the influence of the church was uh, larger under the, the, the previous government and in the previous political situation, but it seems that the church feels the need to speak more often on behalf of issues that pertain to direct human rights, because this is exactly what we're talking about, the mm -hmm. liberties and rights that are you know, within basically a, a secular state. For some reason, the, the church doesn't feel the need to speak about corruption, to speak about other issues that are very important in society, and that's exactly that. That's a very As good you point. Mentioned, you know, corruption is corruption everywhere. Yeah. Extortion is extortion everywhere. But on the local level, as well as on the national level, the church is silent on those issues. So those are the moral, moral that issues. Is, that is that is a very, very raised. good point. I agree absolutely with you. And I think it is a, a good deal of hypocrisy when the churches uh, speak about, uh, you know, the sexual-related uh, issues absolutely. instead of speaking about um, um, corruption and injustice and so forth, this is a, a great disproportion in the message of, in the message of the church. I absolutely agree. And my point exactly was is that the church needs to speak much more uh, on the uh, on these social issues than on other issues. Uh, it does mean that the church should ignore. Uh, all the you know issues that uh, uh, that pertain to to the human life, but um, it is hypocritical when the church uh, keeps a blind eye, eye on the corruption and speaks on the uh, on, uh, on only on the very reduced moral agenda. Uh, I will support your point in this. I, we have already gone over our appointed hour. I think we could go much longer, but I think. In all fairness to our guest uh, and to you, uh, we perhaps will end our formal part. And if you are still willing and you have more questions or comments, Absolutely. we can continue uh, after putting uh, sort of uh, our session into adjournment.